Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Memo Arubla, um, who is the founder of Beat Street AZ. Um, he was born in South America and moved here when he was very young um, to New York City, uh, where he um, developed an interest not only in law enforcement, but also in hip hop um, and hip hop culture, uh, including the music, break dancing, DJing. Um, and it was during this time um, that he realized he was spending more time in the studio than he was on the street. Um, he went to school for forensic science before going to the police academy and uh, became an officer of the law. Um, and in 2006, he moved here uh, to continue on his uh, in law enforcement. Um, but in 2015, um, after a few other programs that he was a part of, he started his own program, um, which is dedicated to uh, developing, educating, and empowering youth to become resilient, but future-minded leaders in the community through hip hop culture. Um, these students, uh, these young students are able to spend more time, like he did, uh, in the studio than they are on the streets. Um, and they're learning not only about how to make music, but how to produce it. They're learning about graphic design through things like graffiti. Um, Mr. Rubla is um, absolutely a phenomenal person, and I'm very excited for him to speak to you today. Um, so please join me in welcoming Memo. I'm from New York, sorry, so I'm animated when I speak, and cameraman, I'm gonna make you work today. So, sorry. Um, how you doing, everybody? How's everybody doing? So, I'm Memo Arubla. Um, let me start by saying, yes, I am a sergeant with the City of Phoenix Police Department. Uh, worked with NYPD from 98 to 06 when I came here to this beautiful city. Before I get into my program, which is called B Street AZ, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the why. Why did I start B Street? Why did I get uh, so involved as far as youth and education? <clears throat> so I begin my story with uh, my family, my dad and my mom who were born in Colombia. Um, my father, for those of you who've watched Narcos, anybody? So unfortunately, I got a lot of family members on that show. Uh, not proud of it, but that's where I come from. So my father was involved heavily with, the, with Pablo Escobar because we're all from the same town. Uh, and that's where I was born as well, which is Antioquia, Medellin. <clears throat> so with that being said, it's interesting when you're brought up, and I'm, I've been hearing a lot of conversations today. And I've been here from the very beginning. So it's interesting to hear a lot of different perspectives as far as from the juvenile perspective. As a young kid growing up, um, I looked up to the drug dealers. You know, they would come in, they'd have the nice suits, the fancy outfits, and, and the cell phones, the great big brick ones, uh, guns. I have baby pictures of me holding kilos of cocaine, um, which is interesting. The, the police department didn't know about that till later on. But, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, I joke about it now, but it's, it, you know, in retrospect, thinking about it now, it's just, it's crazy. To me, this was normal. It was a normal lifestyle. Not only that, they glorified it. In my family, it was like, you hate the police and you love the villain. And that's how I was raised. So you become desensitized to the violence, to that kind of environment. With that being said, as I started to get a little older, well, first and foremost, we moved then to uh, the United States. And in moving, so we moved to New York. We first originally lived in Queens. That's kind of when Unbeknownst to me, education really became important to me. I'll tell you why. So I started going to the school my first time, and English was a second language to me. Um, you know, I spoke Spanish. That's what we spoke in the household. So when I got to school, I started hearing these kids, you know, talking English and really communicating. Somebody talked about that earlier, um, as far as the second language and communication being really important. So I felt dumb. I felt real dumb because I couldn't express myself. I couldn't talk. I couldn't communicate. Uh, and I got picked on. And I wish I could see those kids nowadays. <laughs> Get them a ticket, no, I'm just kidding. So uh, I felt dumb though, I felt really, you know, just an angry. So at that point, I remember going home and just kind of started listening to, to music. You know, it was, it was my dad's record player. Now my dad at this point was in prison. Um, he had gotten arrested for obviously, you know, dealing drugs. Uh, he got picked up by DA. They actually re-diverted the entire flight because of him. Uh, was supposed to go to Panama, they redirected it to Florida. Once he landed in Florida, they arrested him. So with that being said, 
I was listening to his music, and, and it's through the music that I started to like work on my accent and started to really like hone in on, on the English language as well as obviously what I was being taught in school. So it was interesting though that, you know, so I'm, I'm dealing with this frustration as far as just feeling dumb and, and, and not equivalent to those that I was going to school with, the other children. Um, but now, my father comes out of prison a couple of years later, and he is now, he was introduced to cocaine. He never used it, he would sell it, and when he came out, he became a huge cokehead. Uh, with that being said, I started to witness the violence at home. You know, he would get high and just, for whatever reason, think my mom was seeing somebody and just beat her. He jumped out of a second uh, story window at one point thinking he could fly. Uh, he didn't kill himself, but he broke a couple of bones. But again, here I am as a young child experiencing all this, and you know, to me it was normal. I, you know, I'm thinking like, hey, doesn't everybody go through this? You know, I'd go to school and I hear kids talking about sitting at the dinner table, and I'm like, nobody's talking about, you know, dad beating up mom or any, or any of that, or the uncles coming in and, and you know, having the guns on the table and things of that nature. So obviously, as you get older, something I've noticed in, career, in my career in law enforcement is that when you feel disconnected, and we all, all of us in this room, we all search for a purpose. We're, we're all seeking, you know, just kind of that acknowledgement that we exist. Nobody wants to feel like they don't exist. Um, so in doing so, when you come up and you're raised in such a troubled environment, you start to relate and kind of associate yourself with those that are going through the same experiences. So I always like to say that I started hanging out with the wrong crowd when in fact I was the wrong crowd. Um, I did this presentation once with one of my friends that I grew up with and he called me out on it. He goes, uh, dude, you were the wrong crowd, not us. I said, okay, touche. <laughs> but uh, so in my teen years, uh, again, just started doing knucklehead things, which I can't speak of because I'm being recorded. <laughs> so, but. Uh, Regardless, I was doing a lot of bad things. Um, and it, it felt good. It felt, for the first time, you know, I was being acknowledged by my friends, like, oh, he's crazy, or whatever the case was. So it, it was just an interesting phenomenon that was taking place. But at the same time, I was called the undercover nerd because I always held education as a primary goal for me. I mean, I just always never wanted to feel stupid again like I did in kindergarten when I couldn't speak English. So, fast forward, because I mean, I can, this story is pretty long, lengthy, but, um, and I know we gotta get out of here by four. So, <clears throat> fast forward, I made it a point to make sure that I graduated high school, and I made it a point to get into college. However, there were two things, and I, I feel very fortunate, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, Benny and Johnny aren't here, because uh, I've been to Rikers, I've seen what Rikers is inside, not as a, not as an inmate, however, though, when I worked with NYPD, and I can tell you right now that place, it's, it's like a dungeon, I, I, you know, and I have family and I have friends that have been to Rikers and there's nothing good that has ever come from that place. So, two things that I was very fortunate of, and I always joke around and said, you know what, the reason why I have the opportunities that I have today and the successes uh, was because I was fast and I was just never caught. But um, truth of the matter is that as I grew up, I got really involved in the hip-hop culture. During the 80s, that's kind of when hip-hop culture exploded in New York City. Um, it kind of came to life. And a lot of people associate hip-hop with rap, and I hate that word rap, but a lot of people's like, oh, it's rap, and it's gang, and it's violence, and, and you know, sex, and drugs. Um, I had one friend of mine at work I was listening to Biggie Smalls, if any of you are familiar with the artist. Um, yeah, and I get it, the lyrics are a little, you know, profane. So, you know, one of my fellow officers comes in, he goes, dude, you listen to that music? I'm like, yeah, of course, I love it, I grew up on this. He's like, yeah, but come on, man, like, they talk about sex and drugs and violence and stuff. I said, yeah, and you're right. I said, but, you know, it's how you interpret it, you know? Uh, I said, let me ask you something, what do you like to listen to? He's like, rock and roll. I said, well, finish this sentence for me, sex, drugs. And he was like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I said, but interesting enough, you know, I grew up on the culture, and for those of us or those that are what we call hip hop heads in the community, uh, if you know anything about the hip hop culture, it's based on four elements, uh, which is b-boying, break dancing, MCing, rapping, DJing, and graffiti. However, the real concept of hip hop culture is about unity, peace, and love, uh, and that's something that kind of 
lost its way as the hip hop culture became commercialized, if you will. Uh, Cause nowadays I can't even understand half the thing those rappers are saying, it's more like mumble rap. Um, but anyhow, so I was very fortunate in that I got involved in that hip hop culture and it really grew on me. So I started to dance, I started to get involved. I never really DJ, but I started to, I, I played instruments as a young kid. Uh, it was kind of my way of, to release some of the anger that I had. Um, so I, I really started getting involved as those years, you know, as I started to get older. Now, when college came around, I was very fortunate because I had a lot of opportunities based on those expression, you know, those arts that I had developed. Um, I got a chance to teach at Alvin Ailey, which is really, you know, prestigious school as far as dance. Uh, I got uh, opportunities to shadow in some recording studio and uh, with some engineers, uh, with artists like India Ari, if any of you are familiar with her, Busta Rhymes. Um, so I was very fortunate enough to have those opportunities. So I spent a lot of time in music studios. What kind of was the epiphany for me, and mind you, during this whole time, I was still being that same old kid who liked the trouble, liked going out and hanging out with the friends and you know, getting into mischievous things. So one day, we were playing basketball. Now, my five foot five self had no business playing basketball, but I was playing basketball nonetheless. I fell and I hurt my hip. Uh, the reason why I, bring, I always talk about the story because this was a pivotal moment in my life. Uh, so that very same night, I had really hurt myself, like I could barely walk, and I get a, a beep, so I had a beeper. So yes, a while ago. Uh, so I called my friend back, and they're like, yo, uh, we're heading up to the Bronx tonight, um, you know, come join us. I was like, yeah, I can't go, you know, my hip. So they punked me out over the phone, and they were like, oh, dude, you know, stop being a punk, you, you know. And what the funny thing is that the peer pressure that I felt, like not being with my boys and, you know, I'm, I'm letting them down and I really wanted to be there. And I really tried to make an effort to go, but I couldn't. I just couldn't walk. So I didn't go. So what ended up happening that night was they went to the Bronx. They ended up stealing a car. It was three of my friends. Um, lo and behold, the cops caught up to them. There was a little bit of a chase. They crashed jumped out of the car. One of my friends got caught, but two of them got away. Uh, however, they were in the wrong neighborhood. And back then, we used to rock these beads if you were part of a gang. Now, I say that because we weren't really a gang. It was just like five of us. We thought we were a gang. So we had these beads and, you know, we, we you know, proudly expressed our colors or whatever. So they were in this neighborhood in the Bronx where they shouldn't have been. Um, long story short, they got confronted by, the, by a rival gang and one of my friends got stabbed. I get the phone call in the morning. Hey, Pedro's in the hospital. And you know, so off I go. But it was at that moment that I realized, what am I doing with my life? Then, fast forward, a couple of months later, um, mind you, I'm about 16 at this point, after my friend got stabbed, I'm 16, and I get a phone call from an ex-girlfriend telling me she's pregnant. And I started crying, that was my first reaction, I'm not even gonna lie to you. But I don't mean like the soap opera cry with the nice, no, like bubble snot, you know, bottom lip quivering, like, and then I asked her, what are you doing? She said, I'm keeping it, and I cried even harder. <laughs> so ah, my life is over. So I bring up these two moments in my life because if it weren't for these two moments, I would not be here talking to you. I'd probably be somewhere in Rikers, to be honest with you, or God knows where if I'd even be alive. So between my friend getting stabbed and that kind of being the moment where I realized what am I doing as far as the purpose in life, and then when I became a father at the age of 16, it was at that moment that I realized something, that I am now a role model to somebody else, whether I liked it or not. Not only that, I started to analyze how I felt about my own personal father, based on everything he had put my mom and myself through, um, which we endured a lot, violence, uh, we had a stint with homelessness, and all other kinds of stuff and abuse. And it was at that moment that I realized I'm becoming him, as far as an example. And I'm, I'm only going to kind of continue this vicious cycle, which, which, which is what you see a lot of in the hood, uh, as we call it back east. And it's interesting because growing up, a lot of my friends, they don't, and, and it's kind of the culture, and this is kind of where, um, I was talking to Luis, who I know over there in the back from the correctional department, and I was talking, I said, you know, this is a great conference and all. I said, but I would love if the kids were here. 
because they're the ones that need it. We, we are all in the same, for the same purpose. We're all here. But, you know, granted, yeah, I can come up here and tell you my story, and that's great, and this is what I do, but at the end of the day, I need the kids to know what resources are out there for them. And it's kind of that culture in the hood where we don't promote education. You know, as much, as, as much great work that everybody here has done, and I applaud you for it, myself included, I go out there and I do kind of both sides of, of the work. Um, when I say about the culture, it's kind of like that modern day slavery mentality is what I like to call it. And I, I refer to sports and the entertainment world. You think about sports and you see, when you go to the hood and you say, hey, there's a science camp. You know, do you want to send your kid? No, I'm sending him to the football camp. I need my son to throw hard. I need my son to run fast. And when you really look at the statistics, less than 1% make it to the NFL or NBA or any professional level. And what's interesting is, let's look at the real, the NCAA. You have a lot of kids that strive, and I run another program on fitness, and a lot of them are football players. Well, they're gonna pay my tuition. Well, that's interesting because they don't tell you how to use that education. They just give you that education for you to play. And a lot of these coaches pick those classes for the students. I know a lot of athletes that they wanted to do something, but the coaches said, nope, you gotta take these classes because they're easier, and this way you can play. And you can make the games. So it's interesting to me how these young men and women are exploited through sports, and then once you have no value, you can't build those billion dollar stadiums and coaches ain't making millions of dollars, then Thank you for everything. But because you never focused on the educational piece, now what do you do? And that's kind of the problem that I saw growing up in the hood. Uh, and my father did that to me. He put me in sports. Uh, and I played all kinds of sports because of him uh, later in life when he fixed himself. But so when I got to college, again, based on every, and I'm giving you this whole story because I'm kind of setting up the scene as to why I started B Street AZ along with several other programs. So when I got to college, that's, again, like I said earlier, I started, a lot of avenues started opening up, and I started kind of, oh, when, you, when you're from the hood, that's all you know. And, and it's kind of like, you don't really believe there's a world outside of it. And, and that's what I thought. I thought, hey, you know what? It's just this corner, it's just this block, and it's just my boys, and that's it. That's all there is to life. That's all I need. Keeping it real, whatever that means. It don't mean anything, to be honest with you. But that's what I thought I was doing. I thought I was keeping it real. But it wasn't until I went to college and I started meeting people with education. And I started, they started giving me different perspective on life. And lo and behold, I went to school as a forensic science major and that's what I thought I wanted to do. Uh, but I then changed and said, you know what? I want to be a cop because at the time, I don't know if you guys remember Amadou Diallo who shot 41 times. Um, I was out there right, picketing, you know? police brutality and all that other stuff, but I've always kind of felt that if you want to fix the problem, you become part of the solution. You just don't sit back and complain about it. So that's why I became a cop. Um, so when I became a cop in 1998 with NYPD, it was great. The training and all that stuff was awesome. But what I found to be even more amazing is when I'd go to those calls for service. Granted, you know, you would have parents that would call you and say, my son is 17 or whatever the case is and I don't know what to do with him, take him. I'm like, so you want me to fix in two minutes what you haven't been able to do in 17 years? Yeah, that's not happening. You know, it's, it, and, 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 and that's when I started to realize there's a problem here in terms of you know, resources, especially when it comes to the hood. So what I started doing is I started volunteering my time and started mentoring kids at Mentor USA, which is a program in, uh, in New York City. And that's kind of where I found my niche as far as helping out youth. And I saw that they really kind of trusted me and they saw that I could relate to them and I connected with them and kind of that mentorship started to develop. So fast forward to 2006 when I moved out here. When I moved out here, now I had enough, quite, I had seven years of experience in law enforcement. And it's interesting because I would get called into a lot of the interviews with juveniles. When they would get picked up, they'd be like, hey mama, would you mind talking to this kid real quick? Because my intro to every interview with every juvenile has been the same. I pull up a chair, I sit down, I say, how you doing young man? What is going on with you inside? What's, what's hurting you? Why are you so angry? Tell me. And sometimes they open up, sometimes you get the real hard ones. And then what I like to do is follow up by telling them a little piece about myself and just kind of opening up. 
And it's through that dialogue that I started to realize, you know what, um, kind of like Miss C's uh, talking about that five foot 11 kid, it's true. A lot of these kids, you know, in law enforcement, it's, it's, it's difficult for, for some officers to see more than just what they see in front of them as far as a criminal act. It's, it's difficult. Um, some are capable of doing it, I do it, uh, but others, it's, it's, you know, it's a little bit more difficult for them not to be able to see that. So when I started doing that in 2006, when I got here, I started to kind of just, let me see what programs the, the Phoenix Police Department is doing. So in 2011, I started what's called the Citizens Youth Academy, because what I did is I went around to the schools, I said, give me your worst kids. I want your worst kids, those that are getting expelled or you know, have been arrested or whatever the case is, and they gave them to me and I said, okay, great. I took them down to the academy, I partnered up with this program, a uh, group called um, Arizona Common Ground, which is a re-entry program. Uh, Franz Beasley, for any of you in the room that know him, powerful speaker, great man, great friend of mine. We partnered up and we started to put on a mentorship program. So what happened was that it got really politically involved and I've heard some of that being brought up today and it's true, sometimes things get political. So I kind of just handed it over to the police department and said, you know what, run with it. They've done a great job. It's flourished. Um, but then after that, I kind of got a taste as to what I was able, uh, capable of doing as far as you. So I wanted to kind of create something else but make it my own. I didn't want to partner up with the police department because I know, especially when it comes to hip hop, historically, law enforcement, we're the enemy. You don't, the two don't mix. So when I started to think about what I could do, um, I wanted to fo focus in on hip hop culture. Why? Because that's what saved my life. The time that I spent in those music studios and in the recording studios is the time that kept me away off the streets. And then on top of that, I wanted to provide a way to just mentor kids and lure them in. Because if I said, hey, I'm a police officer and I have a program for you, come on in. They were like, yeah, nah. <laughs> we're not working with the cops. I ain't no snitch. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll go into schools, I don't tell them I'm an officer, I come in, I share my story in great length, and then I open it up for questions. And then at the very end, once I've kind of gained their trust and they kind of, you know, connected with me is when I tell them what I do uh, for a living. So when I created Be Street AZ, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel because there's a lot of hip hop programs already out there. People teaching kids how to break dance, people teaching kids how to, you know, uh, DJ and things like that. So I wanted to bring in an educational and as well as a technological component to it because that's what most young kids today associate with, technology. Uh, so what we did is I used the four elements of hip hop culture, uh, b-boying, emceeing, graffiti, and DJing. And we created these, I created this curriculum where we teach them certain set of skills. So through emceeing, we teach effective communication and public speaking. Uh, again, a lot of these kids, when they come to us, and I recruit them from schools is what I do, um, they're not comfortable in their own skin. Uh, they've never talked in front of a crowd before or an audience. Uh, and we kind of break them out of those shells uh, to the point where they start to learn how to write poetry. And I kind of start teaching them, you know, more than how to rhyme words with rich. Because a lot of these kids, they're like, oh yeah, I'm an MC. And I'm like, yeah, okay, let's, first of all, let's, let's work on vocabulary. And then I talk to them about vernacular. Because when I go back home, I, I go back to hood. Like I go, I go back, I'm going back in August and I'll go back to, you know, Brooklyn and I go back to Queens and I see my people and, I become the old hood again. Like, what up, son? You know, and all that good stuff. But then when I'm talking, you know, when I'm at work, depending on my audience, it's like I always tell my people, know your audience. And it's changing that vernacular. It's not a sense of you losing who you are. It's just knowing your audience and being respectful of your audience. So we talk about that. We talk about those things because some of these kids are like, well, I don't want to talk like that. I'm not going to talk white. I'm like, wait, what does that even mean? Like, proper English, <laughs> you know? And it's, it's, it's just interesting to me, the, the mindset of some of these young kids uh, in, our, in, our, in our communities. So through that, we teach all that. As far as graffiti, what I like to do is, obviously I focus in on what's criminal and what's not. I talk about it from a perspective of it being art, because um, there's paintings that, of uh, graffiti paintings that have sold for $10,000, uh, and I grew up on graffiti, so we teach them though graphic design. So I teach them, so one thing with graffiti artists, because they use my program as a graffiti diversion program. So one thing with a graffiti artist is like, you kind of have that itch, because again, you want to be acknowledged. You want the world to know who you are. So you need to, I'm gonna tag up this wall. So if you see Memo in the bathroom, I apologize. I'm just kidding. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, so you know, you want to, so what I teach these kids is like, listen, 
Because there's now like these social mediums, these social uh, kind of forums for, for graffiti artists to put their work on there and they get the likes, they get people to follow them and things like that. So what we do is I say, hey, listen, you can use Photoshop and uh, we can let's go tag up the Berlin Wall. Let's go tag up the Eiffel Tower. And they're like, wait, you can do that? I'm like, yeah, we can make it look real and then you can put it on those things and you a lot of people tell me you were in Paris and then you didn't get caught. So it's interesting because they like, oh wow. So like I can really put my name out there, make people think I was in, I've traveled the world and I've done it all from my room. So it's a great way to teach them that and they're not only, like I said, um, they kind of get, they scratch that itch and at the same time they're learning the skill. They're learning how to, you know, um, do graphic design, because then we kind of dive into a little bit of web design as well. Uh, through DJing, the turntables, which to me is like, okay, this is cool, yeah, we'll show you how to do the turntables, but then I get more into like, I'm gonna teach you how to make music, let's learn a little bit more on the engineering side of it. Uh, they're equipped with iPads, and we use a lot of software, um, and you don't, we, nowadays music, the way it's made, you don't even know how, to, you don't need to know how to play an instrument. So uh, we teach them different types of sampling, we teach them how to loop, uh, and then we also teach them how to, um, take all songs and mix uh, and mix down uh, different types of music. So through breakdancing, uh, we don't make them spin on their heads or anything like that, but we do focus on fitness. So we do bring, I used to teach it, but I'm getting too old for that. And it just takes a lot of days to recover from those classes. So I started, I hired somebody a lot younger than myself. And what she does is she comes in and it's kind of like through hip hop, we, we also teach fitness and nutrition. So I'll, let me talk about that real quick. So we also, on top of the four classes, we incorporate six seminars, if you will. And those six seminars are college readiness. So we talk about, you know, how do you get ready for college? How do you, you know, what's, what's, what is the difference between a scholarship and a loan, you know, and a grant? So a lot of these kids, you know, it comes down to the lack of resources in the community, and sometimes they just don't have the time to go explore these resources. Now, granted, I know they have cell phones and, you know, access of it to, to all endless amounts of information, but again, when you have parents at home, if you have both parents, you're lucky enough, but typically and statistically, you know, usually it's just one parent, they're out there working, and usually it's the kid that's about 12, 11 years old that's raising the rest of his siblings. You know, they're, they're very unaware of what's out there or how to seek that information. Uh, so again, that's where we come in and kind of just help them, guide them through the, uh, how, to, how to find that stuff as far as college readiness. Job readiness, we, get, we prepare them for job interviews. You know, how do you dress? Again, getting back to that vernacular. You know, how do you speak? You know, just certain, I, I mean, I'll have to tell you guys, I'm sure we all aware of that. So um, also, financial responsibility. I talk to them about credit scores. You know, what is an APR? How does that affect you? And I tell them, like, you know, there's certain jobs, you, they'll check your credit score and you may not get. Law enforcement, they check our credit score. If you have a really bad credit score, they're not hiring you because you become a liability and possibly stealing stuff. Um, so there's certain jobs, now even apartments, to even places to live, they'll check your credit score. So we talk to them about those kinds of things. Um, nutrition, um, obviously self-explanatory, leadership, and um, we also, so, so with each seminar, what we do is we incorporate it into each um, element. So for example, with graffiti, we teach the entrepreneurship class, and what we do is, through the graphic designing, then we teach them how to create logos, and say, listen, you can start a small business, here's 10 steps on how to create a small LLC, and you can start selling logos. You can start designing websites using something as simple as like Wix. So what it is, is I'm teaching these kids, and I'm catering to what we call the hustle. In, in the hood, and it's, it's how do I make money effortlessly? And that's why we lose so many kids to drugs, you know, to the drug trade, because to them it's like, wait, you want me to go to school eight to 10 years and work McDonald's or a low paying job, and it's gonna take me how long to make how much money? Now nah, I'm gonna go sell drugs because I can make 250, $300 a day just standing on the corner or just transporting a bag of dope, that's it. And you know, sometimes they know what the consequences are, but they don't care. And it's not that they don't care because they don't care what's gonna happen to their futures, they don't care because it's a survival for them. It's, you know, this is what I have to do to survive. And I know what that mentality is because I used to have that mentality. So, <clears throat> again, what we do is we incorporate these, these seminars within the main courses to provide them life skills, essentially. Uh, at the end of, and it's an eight-week program, we service kids from the ages of 12 to 18. Uh, we target high schools, um, 
junior high schools, charter schools from public and charter. Uh, we've also, I've partnered up with uh, juvenile probation and detention. I recruit kids from there. And I'll be honest, I even recruit kids from, and my position now is I'm not on patrol. I don't answer 911 calls. But the guys already know when they have a kid, they come and get me. Hey, Memo, we need you to talk to this kid. And I'll go in there and I'll recruit kids that are just being arrested. Like, hey, listen, here's my card. Here's my personal number. Call me. Um, and the thing is that I take this very personally because to me, um, I feel very fortunate, very lucky to kind of be in the position that I'm at. Um, everybody in my generation and my family has been arrested. Everybody with the exception of my siblings, uh, because I set an example for them and I kind of you know, ensured that they weren't going to follow the same path as the rest of my cousins. Um, I was the only one born in South America. Mind you, I still have cousins that don't speak English, uh, that never finished high school. Um, so it's upsetting to me to see that there's people that were born here and had kind of, you know, and when I say privileges, I don't mean privileges on a political, I just mean you do, you have certain privileges that you can take advantage of and you don't. And it obsessed me that I was like, I had to become a citizen in 1996, and I had to take all kinds of routes to, do, to get to where I'm at. And you know, I practiced the English language, and I ensured that you know, I was never going to get called dumb again or made fun of my accent. Now I get picked on my New York accent, but that's something else. So, but, so to me, it's, it's very frustrating. And it comes down to that effort. And I think effort is something that a lot of our kids lack. Uh, and I think it's a, more of a generational thing, too, as well, because of technology. Um, you know, these kids nowadays, everything is fast. Everything is quick. You know, God forbid you, your Wi-Fi slows down. And even us, some adults, you know, are guilty of it. You're like, Ugh. I'm like, there was a day where you have to wait and listen to that dial-up modem sound. <laughs> and, you know, just, or the, the most infamous one is, you know, like I have a teenager at home. Um, you know, he'll open up the fridge. Milk, his eggs, his bread, and ah, damn, there's nothing to eat. And he closed the fridge. I'm like, dude, are you kidding me? You mean there's nothing that you can put in the microwave to hit a button? There's food, there's eggs, I mean, you can make. He's like, yeah, no, that's, I'm not going to cook. Oh, the other day, I saw him pulling out a pan, and he was like, oh, it's dirty. So he spent more time trying to find another pan than just cleaning that one. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, I'm trying to find another pan. I'm like, you've been at it three minutes. Just watch that one and make your eggs. You would have been eating already. So it's just interesting to me that the kids, they don't put in that effort anymore. Um, and again, I blame technology a lot for that, but I mean, I could be mistaken. Uh, but nonetheless, so what we do also with our group, with B Street AZ, is once our kids are done, because one thing that I've learned in my life and my personal experiences, uh, especially working with youth and as far as law enforcement, that one of the things where we fail kids a lot, especially you know kids that don't have access to resources, is with continuity. So we'll come into their lives momentarily and say, hey, we're going to help you. And then they're off. And that's it. They don't hear from us again. And it's kind of like, how do you expect to be successful when you're thrust back into the same environment? It's very hard. Because the same temptations are then going to lure you back into what, you, what originally got you in trouble. Um, so that's something that I like to provide. And I, I make it very personal with my kids. Like, I've taken some of my kids from my program even to my house. Uh, unfortunately, I had, I've only had one kid that's gotten back into the system from those of all of my students that have been arrested. Uh, he was involved in a shooting last year, um, shot a girl and who's paralyzed out in Levine. Uh, he's back in the system now. Um, but yeah, I had brought him home for a 4th of July weekend. And, you know, so when I saw the news, you know, I, I heard comments like this monster, you know, like, like it's good for him. And it's crazy because I was like, this kid was in my house. And when I brought him home, you know, because him and my son were the same age, and his, his, he's got one, you know, kind of like that statistical story. His, his mom passed away, his father wanted nothing to do with him, never been in his life, so he, him and his sisters, and his five sisters were put into the foster care system. An aunt came and took all the sisters, but left him because he smoked weed, so she didn't want to deal with him. So, of course, you already got a kid that's feeling like, I'm not wanted. But, you know, you took my siblings, that's cool. So they put him into the foster, a foster family, took him, and that's when I met him. So when I asked him 4th of July, I said, hey, Hector, what are you doing? He's like, ah, oh, you know, nothing. So I was like, hey, let me talk to your foster parent and see if you don't, if, you know, they don't mind you staying the weekend with us. So he was like, fine. I woke up in the morning, and I go downstairs, you know, and, and my wife at first was like, well, you're bringing who home? And I'm like, sometimes you just got to take that risk. You know what I mean? And I, like I said, I'm, I just, I feel I'm good in, re in reading people. In my 19 years in law enforcement, he was a good kid. He's genuinely a good kid, just bad environment. 
And sure enough, he came in our house. It was yes, sir, no, sir, and super polite. I woke up that morning. I come downstairs, and he's doing my dishes. I never asked him. And he's just washing dishes. He's like, sir, you need anything else done? I'm like, Hector, just go relax, man. Go watch TV. Go, like, what are you doing? Get my kid down here to come wash those dishes. So, uh, but it was so nice. And then, you know, he, he kind of grew on me and just kind of, you know, he told me I was like a dad to him. And so, it, you know, it's like I, I grow these personal relationships with these kids. They all have my number. They've called me. They'll call me at 3 o'clock in the morning. Hey, Memo, I have a problem or whatever it is. I always tell them I'll be a friend before I'm a cop. Uh, and they know that. So with that being said, though, I make sure that my kids who graduate our program, which is an eight-week program, um, they're able to come back as instructors or mentors. I give them a place within our organization. And I just created a student advisory board uh, where I'm going to start teaching them management skills and how to, you know, kind of just what it takes to operate an, uh, an organization. Um, so with that said, that is what Beach Street AZ does. Currently, we're now, um, the City of Phoenix Housing is going to implement us in two housing sites, uh, and we're going to be contracted for the next six years. So that's great because a lot of the kids there um, need programs. Uh, one of the thing is that, so my board pushed that we, because when I first offered this program, I made it free. My board didn't like that because they're like, well, how are we gonna expand? Which I get, I get it, it's, it's a business at the end of the day. So they came up with this ridiculous number. So the last two classes, I've scholarshiped everybody. So they're probably going to kick me. I'm going to be like the next Steve Jobs. Like, get out, <laughs> even though you started this. Um, I scholarship. I just, I just feel bad charging these kids. Fortunately for us, for us, we've had um, some really good, rich donors uh, who really believe in what I do. Uh, so that's how we've been able to, you know, provide them with iPads and computers and laptops for all the technological, um, ex you know, uh, things that we show them. So with that said, that is Beach Street AZ. I think we have like 15 minutes left, so I'll open it up for questions, if any. Oh. Thank you.